um, so hello everyone. Um, really happy to be here presenting. Um, you may recognize um, that I work for BT. Um, of course, we have three different group brands though that are present underneath that, um, that sort of moniker. So we, we of course run three different brands and I'm gonna talk about all three as best I can. Um, some of you may remember that Nick Heatley has given presentations um, in the past on this subject to this forum. Um, Nick and I actually work in the same team. And um, since joining BT nearly three years ago, I've taken over a little bit of the evangelism internally for IPv6, I think it's probably best to say. Um, have been accused of soapboxing more than once, and um, I'm going to continue to do that because it's good fun. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of an overview of where we've come in the last, oh, I suppose it's, it's more like 24 months, I suppose, um, but um, just to um, this is, I, I, would, I would say, and of caution, this is mostly evolutionary. It is certainly not revolutionary at this point. So I think we'll probably recognize most of this, but without further ado. So up and to the right, I think that's, that's the best way I can summarize this slide. Um, we're, I think, somewhere near 20 points up um, on AS2856s, um, which is the, the main UK broadband network. Um, about 20 points up on the last time I think this was presented. So we're nearing 80% of user preferred traffic as measured by APNIC, um, which is based on YouTube adverts, which is, you know, that's absolutely fascinating. It's brilliant to see. I'm really, really happy with that. The other one that was quite interesting was the um, AS12576 traffic, which is um, EE's network that we've, um, you know, obviously inherited since the acquisition. Um, and at, at the APNIC graphs, actually staying steady around about 35%, but Akamai actually see that as nearly 80% themselves as well. So perhaps the difference there is in people using browsers to browse YouTube on tablets, various other things, versus using the app, um, the iOS app or the Android app, potentially, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but it's very good to see that we're getting IPv6 out to lots and lots and lots of millions of end users. I think it's really cool. Um, AS6871, which is Plusnet's AS number, those of you who know your AS number as well. Um, Obviously, there's not a lot there. Um, so going into the, the three brands and um, being a bit more general about fixed line versus mobile, we do have some plans here to, um, well, we have some plans to enable IPv6 on Plusnet by the end of next fiscal year. There's no commitment to that at the moment. Unfortunately, we can um, be derailed very, um, very easily as has been, um, you know, the, the things like the pandemic and everything, you just can't predict what's going to happen. So we've got it in the plan. Um, we can't commit to it at the moment. One of the other thorns that um, frustrates some of us is the lack of DNS resolvers um, pushed out to uh, BT, Home Hub, and Smart Hub users, um, IPv6, native IPv6 transport for, for DNS resolution. Um, again, we're planning to have that enabled and pushed out um, by the end of the next fiscal year, again, there's some things that could come in and derail that. Um, a lot of the work in encrypted DNS um, and the requirements placed upon ISPs there um, is likely vying for some of the same human time um, to deal with, with those upgrades and the money involved. So that's, you know, that's a big problem. At the moment though, I mean, looking at AS2856 in particular, I think we've gotten most of the easy wins out of our V6 deployments. Um, we're still doing some some interesting things like replacing Home Hub fives, which unfortunately don't support IPv6. Um, but Halo and and the um, you know the the more modern products, the full fiber and and fiber to the curb uptake, that's changing this um, relatively rapidly. And as I say, we're, we're hitting that eighty percent now, but we're, we're probably sort of tailing off very slightly for desktop users. Um, the one thing that the plea that I would make is that customers own CPE, um, be it a business line or a home line lease line, broadband, anything, if you're using your own CPE and you're not using the BT supplied um, devices, please please do configure them for V6. If you don't know what those configurations should look like, please do ask. Um, mobile wise, it's a little bit more vague in terms of mobile. Um, we're, at, we're, we're working on some massive projects at the moment internally. Um, in the midst of all of this, we are currently trying to investigate ways of enabling more handsets. Um, for V6 only, 464X lap um, across all of the brands that we we operate, um, we still have some some tricky tricky behaviours. Um, there's some some fun interactions there between the various ways in which we do wholesale arrangements and VMOs um, and certain handset quirks. Um, we can't go out and do what has been done in certain other places where we you know force a, a hacked version of Android onto phones. Um, however, 
one thing I will point out is um, over time, uh, those of you that are paying a lot of attention to the, the graphs on the previous page, you will see, um, uh, just a note, you will start seeing V6 traffic moving away from 12576 over to 2856. So from our old EE network over to BT uh, UK's network. That is a, a very long term goal. I'm not entirely sure how fast or how, um, you know, how, how swiftly that will happen at this point. Um, but as we are building our new Ericsson 5G core, the traffic is going to start originating from 256. So when we get down to doing something a little bit more, shall we say, um, oops, when we try, when we get down to doing something in a, a, a bit more of a merge of the two networks, we'll communicate to our peers and everyone who needs to know um, to let them know about that ahead of time. More generally, um, I just wanted to, to, to finish on um, a couple of questions maybe, or just a few talking points. Um, We've got a lot of um, architectural focus on internal use cases at the moment as well. Um, I think there's a heck of a lot more work for us to do there. We've, we've got, as I say, we've got a lot of easy wins out to the consumers. Um, there's a lot of V6 available to customers, even if they're not using it. Um, so now we're thinking about what we can do internally, um, particularly with training. Um, the RIPE IVV6 courses are, are very well received. I, I've, I've been sharing out all the free codes I've been getting um, for those and, and internally everyone's enjoying that. So those are very good. Um, you know, we do have to think about our global endeavors as well. We're not just a UK based company and we've got a lot of work going on in various other markets, um, mostly, you know, across the entire globe. Um, and and we, we also have to look at what's the price of IPv4 do um, to our future prospects. So potentially at some point we have to be more efficient with our use case, uh, our uses of IPv4 just because they're expensive. Um, so what does that do for the, the future of IP, IPv6 only broadband? Um, and I think that's a wider question that we should probably be taking to some of the other ISPs that are here. Um, and I'd love to hear what their thoughts are on that. So that's the end of that. Um, any questions? I'm going to have to have a look in the chat, aren't I? Yeah, we're looking to. Pretty graphs. <laughs> that was good. It was going up, you know, that's what matters. Mm. Um, it's very much up in the right. As I say, it's, this is evolutionary. Um, a lot of my internal, a lot of my focus at the moment is on how we're using V6 internally or not, as the case may be. <laughs> Uh, why is PlusNet so slow in IPv6? Good question. I'm not sure I can answer that properly. Um, very large companies have um, <laughs> budgets <laughs> that are um, being vied for quite a lot of the time. And at the moment, we have um, a number of things that we'd like to do um, and a limited amount of money to do it. So that's mostly, and I should say money also, the number of people involved um, is, is limited as well. So it's a constraint, um, you know, there, there are constraints there that we have to, we have to work around. Um, there's a lot of questions in here about home net. Uh, well, um, Okay, uh, Veronica, I mean, I, I, I don't see any. Um... Oh, there's a question there from I Halsey. Um, will 5G handsets get V6 addresses? Uh, some of them, yes. I think some of them already are, in fairness, if I'm being honest. I, th I think if you have a quick look, if you're on a, an EE um, pay monthly contract, you should probably see IPv6. Uh, if you go to test-ipv6.com. Okay, there's one more from Tim Coot. Um, interesting question, Tim. Um, from my perspective, I am not involved in any work on that space. So, um, 
I don't know if you want to, to catch up with me afterwards and um, kind of drill down on that a little bit more. Um, but I mean, broadly, I, I, I actually don't know how to answer that question, I'm afraid. More questions, Tom. <laughs> uh, good question about security. I like that. Um, as far as I'm aware, IPv6 security is on par on the, the routers and firewalls that we supply. Um, we, we've, uh, I, I don't know if anyone notices, but we have a massive, massive contingent of security employees um, at BT. They have the whole, um, whole own organization internally um, and a bunch of extra security architects for good measure. You know, we're, we're hugely hot on security. Um, uh, you know, the big topic internally is as we move to internal V6 networks or dual stack networks, you know, what does that mean for the security of that infrastructure? So um, we wouldn't be pushing out hubs knowingly with less security uh, for IPv6 and IPv4. I think within the, <clears throat> within the ITF, there was, uh, Eric is here, so can correct me if I'm wrong. There was a proposal called simple security, which is generally having the device um, closed, I think, but open for specific ports and services and allowing things like ICE and IPsec. Is that sort of model you follow or is it a different thing? I'm not aware. Okay. I can take that question away though, if you'd like me to go and ask it. Yeah, it'd be interesting, interesting to know both for yourselves and, and Sky what the sort of default is <clears throat> shipping boxes. Yeah. I mean, the original, obviously there was a lot of original hype with V6 that it enables full end to end and all the firewalls will be open, blah, blah, blah. But as that question hints in practice, you, you don't want to be making anything worse. Um, there's a question there about HSCN. I, I don't know who this ACK, ACK, ACK person is, but um, there's lots of good questions coming out of you. Um, it's um, mostly covered by BT connectivity, HSCN. I don't think BT, is HSCN entirely us? I didn't think it was. I thought Redcentric were involved in that. Um, and as I understood it, certainly they were running the peering exchange and that was dual stacked. Um, to my knowledge, there's no there's no problem with HSCN, but then again, that's that's not a project that I'm necessarily involved in. 